Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the International Penvita Conference here at uh, Bilkent University in the Department of Communication and Design. And um, I'm very happy to have you all here. Um, yesterday we started an amazing um, day and um, uh, just to repeat, to, to uh, sum up what we did yesterday, um, we had um, two wonderful keynote speeches uh, from Professor uh, David Campbell from, um, uh, from uh, Vienna, Austria. Um, he gave a, um, a speech about the quintuple helix model. This is a very important model, um, what we used, what was in fact the basis of our, um, uh, our whole research. And um, Professor Campbell is one of the co-developers of, um, uh, of this model. And Therefore, we were really happy about that. Um, we celebrated at the same time the 25th anniversary of the Department of Communication and Design. And our head of uh, the um, department, Andreas Treske, um, gave first of all a little overview what happened in um, this uh, department in, um, within the 25 years. It started as a film school. And therefore, we had a distinguished guest, Martin Tau, from um, the University of television and film from Munich and he gave um, also a keynote speech very interesting about the relation between science and art very much focused on um, Ludwig Wittgenstein and afterwards we had the um, end of year exhibition here it is still available so when you have, when we have a question break please have a look this is I'm really proud of the artwork of our students here in the communication uh, education and design department and the final I must say was, um, and the climax I would say from yesterday was uh, in the beer garden, the movie night with the best movies of, um, of the comedy film school students um, um, of this year. Now I'm happy that we have um, two other panels. Um, one is about digitality in uh, pandemic communication processes and one about the legal perspective on pandemic times. But we, before we start with these panels, I cordially would like to welcome Professor Dr. Figen Chismedji Chanel. Um, I want to introduce her first. Um, she is graduated from um, Ankara University Faculty of Dentistry in 1994, completed her PhD at uh, specialty in uh, 2001 at oral um, maxillofacial or maxillofacial um, surgery department uh, of the same university. In 2002, um, she worked as a research fellow in the Department of Oral and Max uh, Maxillofacial Surgery, Washington Hospital Center USA. At the same year, she completed introduction um, to the principles and um, uh, practice of clinical trials certification program at the National Institute of Health in USA after she was appointed as associate professor and she worked as a, um, a rotational attending in the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at Washington Hospital Center in 2009 and in the National Institute for Health, um, uh, Health National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research in the United States 2013. Um, um, she has been appointed as chairman of Turkish, Turkish Healthcare Quality and um, Accreditation Institute in 2018 and still continues her duty. She works as a secretary general, uh, general um, of the presidency of uh, Turkish Health Institute since April 2021. And she was a member of the Higher Education Quality Board and chairman of the Commission of the Recognition and Authorization of External Evaluation and Accreditation Bodies. She is a member of the Ministry of Health Coronavirus Scientific Advisory Board and I was very happy she was already, she supported already very much our uh, Pandavita conference with her expertise and now she will talk about COVID-19 pandemic on the healthcare research ecosystem. I'm glad to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for your invitation. Dear Chair of the conference, uh, Pandevita Organization Committee and dear colleagues, uh, I respectfully greet uh, you all. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, I would like to express my pleasure to attend the Pandevita conference as a speaker. Uh, and uh, as uh, Dr. Lutz uh, mentioned, uh, today I will talk about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the healthcare research ecosystem. My speech includes information about the definition of the healthcare research ecosystem, capacity building and data management, new clinical research strategies, and finally, state of data sharing trends. As we all know, like the uh, change in the structure of many industries, there are also very important changes in health in the age of information and technology. These changes are also reflected in research in health. Uh, these developments make significant contribution to human life. In addition, developed countries provide very important economic inputs uh, in this field and health researchers has become one of the main elements of global competition. The healthcare research ecosystem has many stakeholders. As shown in the diagram, the patient is at the center of the ecosystem. In this ecosystem, we see universities, professionals and services, professional organizations and associations and industry. And one of the most fundamental stakeholders is the government uh, as a policymaker. And finally, funding institutions are one of the main stakeholders, uh, such as to save to be talk in our country. In order to examine uh, the health research ecosystem, I would like to start by defining one of the most important parts of the system, clinical research. Clinical research could be defined as a tangible way to increase quality of life and maybe offer other options and hope uh, when they didn't have any known, any known as one of the leading organization in health research in the world, NIH defines clinical research as a research study prospectively assigned to one or more interventions to evaluate the effects of an interventions on health related biomedical or behavioral outcomes. The subject of clinical research spans a very wide spectrum that cannot be covered in all uh, aspects in 30 or 40 minutes, of course. Uh, the vast uh, majority of us have been involved in many training on clinical research methodology. For this reason, in my presentation today, uh, I will focus more on the capacity building, support, coordination and collaboration, and new strategies, uh, uh, future of the research, especially data sharing in the research. Uh, now, I, I would like to talk about the coordination and collaboration of clinical research, which has started to find a wider place in the literature, especially during the pandemic period. Instead of independent clinical trials, coordination and collaboration could be more effectively facilitated by consolidating funds toward master protocols. Some large-scale clinical studies have been conducted as uh, part of international clinical studies during the pandemic. However, it's determined that some of the country's ecosystem needs further development for clinical trials, and some of them are needed a special establishment for health researchers for the coordination. The COVID-19 pandemic has introduced the research ecosystem to a new topic, collaboration. In this period, the importance of collaboration has emerged strongly. The advancement of science and improved health outcomes require, require collaboration, which includes publishing of all data, regardless of the results, and releasing them to the research community. As the process for dealing with personal privacy and data, data security have become sufficiently more sophisticated over the past 10 years, there is no real barrier to centralizing and sharing individual participant data from different trials under one repository. Funders or other uh, authorized institutions could facilitate that data sharing by having a mandate of sharing anonymized data as a requirement for funding. Investigators should be promoted to utilize existing global clinical research data sharing platforms in which data can be collectively. The data from different trials can be pulled to answer meaningful health questions rather than staying inconclusive in isolation. 
One of the most essential issues in the clinical research ecosystem is capacity and infrastructure building. We can discuss, discuss three main topics about capacity and infrastructures. First one is training, second one is career programs, and the third one is uh, effective engagement. Another issue I should mention is the improper implementation in funding and regulation suggestions. As you know, while conducting many researches, we reach the same results by using the same materials and same methods without knowing each other. During these studies, we, we make non-cost-effective expenditures by using the same materials in repetitive studies in different centers. This causes a serious waste of resources. We only see the results of these studies at the presentation or publication stage after the studies are completed. And we notice uh, these repetitions. Preventing such uh, thrashings, time and financial losses can only be possible with a nationwide coordination. Funding decisions about clinical trial research should aim to create long-term support. To reach the long-term goal of building sustainable capacity for clinical research, it is important to move away from funding short-term small-scale clinical trials. Instead of multiple clinical trials that compete against each other, platform trials can create a framework in which multiple questions can be addressed over time in one large clinical trial that can provide convincing and conclusive evidence. One of the other most important clinical uh, research topics is record systems. It's a necessary to have a standard, reliable, centrally managed record system for the data of studies in health. More widespread use of applications such as clinical trials will be very useful and will enable more effective use of resources. Clinical trial record system allow to, a to be able to keep the trials under control, evaluate current situation and make plans for the future. Systems also allow the effective distribution of trial, trial budgets. With this record systems, trial to be favored by the companies and research institutions for support. Journal editors and professionals are kept informed of ongoing trials. Thus, the awareness of researchers who plan or carry out studies in same fields increases and more useful planning can be made. System also allow to transparency and more visible ethical evaluations. There are record systems, such as clinical trials, that are used around the world, but in order to ensure standardization and make all studies visible on such platforms, research should be directed to these platforms in a more regular way. It's very important to establish international rules in order to use these platforms in a way that covers all research. After presenting record system, I would like to talk about new research strategies developed with COVID-19. At this point, I need to mention collaboration and coordination first. At the beginning of the speech, I talked about coordination and collaboration within the general research ecosystem. However, since these concepts have come to the fore with COVID-19, I would like to mention them here specifically. With COVID-19, it has been very clearly demonstrated that investments should be made to ensure coordination and cooperation in clinical research. Improper funding shames will uh, found large number of small independent studies that are too insufficient to provide conclusive evidence. Core protocols that help to standardize Clinical outcomes across different trials should be prepared. Master protocols can be leveraged to encourage collaborations to generate uh, scientific evidence in a timely manner. The existing infrastructure established through the master protocol can also be leveraged and extended to other research questions, including critical questions regarding unanticipated conditions. Research models that have a large scale, collaborative, a cross-border and designed to effectively answer questions with patient-centered endpoints will be essential for any new or re-emerging health conditions.
In sum up, coordination and collaboration of health research is examined under the heading of the necessity of new clinical research strategies, especially with the pandemic process. In this period, the issue of developing methodologies that can achieve results faster with same effectiveness has begun to be discussed very intensively. It's anticipated that these discussions will lead to radical changes in methodology and conducting of research in all health speciality. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, World Health Organization published a guide in 2022 on these issues. The purpose of sharing and reuse of health-related data for research purposes, WHO policy and implementation guidelines is to clarify the policy and practice on the reuse and onward sharing for research purposes of health data. This covers use in both emergency and non-emergency situations and complements the following. Uh, the policy on use and sharing of data collected in member states by the WHO is outside the context of the public health emergencies. This policy covers the reuse of health data for research purposes. Its scope includes research data generated by research undertaken directly by WHO or funded by WHO, as well as the use of other health data for research purposes. Data, the knowledge uh, derived from the use of that data should be reorganized as a global public good and data sharing and data reuse should be maximized in ways that are effective, ethical and equitable, equitable in order to improve public health. Now, uh, I would like to talk about these notions. Equitability is the first, uh, can be described any approach to the sharing of data should recognize and balance the needs of participants and researchers who generate and use data, other analysts who might want to reuse those data, and those communications uh, communities who expect health benefits to arise from research. And the second one is ethical. All data sharing should balance and protect the privacy of individuals and the dignity of communities while acknowledging the imperative to improve public health through the most productive use of data. And the efficiency, uh, any approach to data sharing should be aimed at enhancing, optimizing the quality and value of uh, using those data and enabling their contribution to improve public health. Data sharing should be done as promptly and uh, in as open a manner as possible, building on existing norms, policies and practices and reducing unnecessary duplication and competition. By the discussion about data sharing and re re uh, reuse, in addition uh, to these three concepts, I need to mention the concepts of fair principles, which is now being uh, used more frequently. The concepts of FAIR consist of the initials of four words as findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This approach usually means choosing an appropriate third-party repository and creating the data so that they are well described using a clear summary, structured so they can be reused and aggregated with similar data sets, and where necessary, anonymized to reduce the possibility of individual participants being identified. It's emphasized by the authorities that who encourages data management and sharing to follow the fair, princi fair principles. Now, uh, I want to talk about another organization implementation, uh, NIH, which is the leading research foundation organization on health researchers, updated its policy on data sharing on May 2022. Like who, the NIH have highlighted the fair principles regarding data sharing. NIH emphasized being more fair, uh, being more fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, as I mentioned before, to further enhance scientific data, scientific data general, um, I'm sorry, with, uh, generated with NIH supports on the updated policy. 
According to the updated policy, studies meeting at least one of the criteria on the slide requires to share final research data. Research applications or proposal requesting uh, 500,000 direct costs or more in, in, uh, in any one year. And the second one, research studies that have 500 or more participants. And, she, uh, and the third one, ancillary studies based on NIH funded parent studies. And uh, the fifth, uh, fourth one, applications proposals submitted in response to funding opportunity announcements that specify inclusion of data sharing plans or <coughs> plans or other research studies deemed appropriate for data sharing by NIH program official. The NIH, however, encourages all applications, uh, applicants to include a plan to address data sharing or to state why data sharing is not possible. Exceptions may be considered to safeguard the right of individuals and communities. These data must only be made available under terms and conditions consistent with the informed consent provided by the individual participants and as approved by the FRD's institutional uh, review board and only local, state and federal laws and regulations. Specific data sharing requirements as appropriate will be included in the funding opportunity announcements, notice of award or contract terms. In the middle of the slideshow, some examples of research currently open for data sharing at the NIH. Uh, these are very good uh, examples. Uh, first one is National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute Biodata Catalyst is a uh, cloud-based ecosystem that offers data, analytic tools, applications and workflows in secure workplaces. And the second one is Biologic Specimen and Data Repository Information Coordinating Center facilitates and coordinates the sharing activities of biological specimens and data from NHLBI, the uh, NHABL Biorepository and its data repository. And the third one, the last one, is National Sleep Research Resource. Uh, is an NHLBA supported repository for sharing sleep data collected on tens of thousands of individuals from cohort studies, clinical trials, and other data sources. Now, uh, I am going to mention a paper on data capture and sharing has been published in Lancet, one of the leading journals in the health research ecosystem. The paper mention, mentions that as of July, July 7, 2022, there are 13,395 real world data publications on, uh, in COVID during COVID-19. Restricting these to the first six, uh, 600 days of the pandemic, uh, there were 5,951 uh, peer-reviewed publications related to real-world data and COVID-19, and a substantial number of research hypotheses were tested using real-world data. The COVID-19 pandemic has fostered many international collaborative efforts for real-world data research. Medical researchers' data is multifaceted in the way that is uh, captured, covering data such as from qualitative surveys or wearable medical devices, efficiency and safety data from clinical trials, routinely collected health data, and audits. Accordingly, the ways in which data are shared are highly variable, ranging from direct transfer of raw medical data in the individual patients to printed summaries of clinical trials published in medical journals or press releases. In these ways, the data are shared to enable and facilitate further research as well as to provide quality assurance if required. Data, regardless of capture and primary type, are shared and assessed in a multitude of form formats, <coughs> ranging from imaging data through the highly ordered clinical codes and numerical outputs of laboratory assessments. Even within these subformats, sub varying specifications exist with regard to data standards, and the software requires the read and use. Uh, use the data. Accordingly, challenges exist both in the ability to share and use core medical data. 
In the paper, it's emphasized that challenges exist for medical data shared at the individual patient level. Some of identified challenges are clinical trials concerned with the potentially misleading secondary analysis, implications for future planned research activities on the primary data, financial and workload burdens of data sharing, and concerns over ethic approval or regulatory implications of data sharing. These challenges are particular, particularly intensified when considering global health inequities, inequities in data sharing exercise for which access to resources that facilitate transfers might be more scarce alongside concerns over the extractive research practices. As such, there, there exists an intrinsic balance to be struck between the capacity to share individual patient data to facilitate novel and meaningful research activities and the individual's burden on principal investigators and research participants. This balance become, becomes increasingly challenging in the context of a global pandemic as the relative benefit of novel research might be offset by the rapid pace of data generation and its subsequent pathways to sh data sharing agreements. Within the context of COVID-19 pandemic, there remains an absence of centralized, sponsor-driven primary data sharing. July 7, 2022, there were 8,000 studies registered on clinicaltrials.gov mixed between observational and interventional trials identified as being associated with COVID-19. It's important to note that there are multifaceted explanations as to why data are not shared in this way, despite the legal requirements in the USA for data sharing via this platform, including, but not limited to, an unawareness uh, the legal requirements, poorer than antici uh, anticipated trial results, results, trial misconducts, statistically important under recruitment and <coughs> language barriers. You can follow the summary of the barriers to uh, and challenges of research using digital health technology, uh, the solutions implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic and future long-term solutions uh, in the slide, on the slide. Although the most detailed form of data sharing would involve individual patient label data, the most frequent form of data sharing occurs in publications is aggregate summary label, da label data. <coughs> The framework for sharing of observational data, such as electronic health records, is not as clear as the framework for sharing data of clinical trials. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with varying formats being proposed. Several coordinated efforts have been made to improve uh, data flows and sharing over the past decades. Some efforts include the adaptation of FAIR, principles, as I mentioned before, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable uh, data. Separately, there have been improvements to user interfaces and project requires pipelines from existing data sharing platforms. In 2017, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors mandated data sharing of clinical trial data, and many funding bodies for medical research around the world have necessity, necessitated the data sharing from any funded clinical research. Research participants could also be advocates for data sharing with previous research indicating that the majority are willing to share their data with both the public and private sectors. And now uh, I would like to conclude my speech with the necessary regulations and recommendations on the important aspects of data sharing. Data sharing uh, requires resources. I'm sorry, it's not okay. Data sharing requires resources and investment. So investment must be done in the data sharing platforms like Pandevita. Uh, done in data sharing platforms like Pandevita. And the second one is data sharing and governance agreements must be made between organizations involved in the data transfers from one organization to another. When international research 
is conducted, there are potentially multiple legal frameworks that must be added to creating challenges when synthesizing uh, data assets. Organizing data for sharing purposes as opos uh, opposed to originally defined research questions requires dedicated personal time both on behalf of the body providing data and the organization receiving and disseminating data. International legal leg, uh, and the third one, international legal regulations for data sharing must be done to avoid problems, problem, problems uh, originating from synthesized data assets, data transfer, required human resources, uh, socio-political barriers to data sharing, and the absence of a common da data dictionary. Simultaneously, there are re re recognized socio-political uh, socio barriers to the data, sh data sharing both within and between institutions, and these are potentially one of the most substantial barriers to data sharing. Although there are many meta, uh, meta registries, uh, a type of clinical data registry that houses or links uh, the data from multiple multiple individually unique clinical data resources, the absence of a com common data dictionary across different individual di data resources can restrict data link linkage and accordingly creates the need for staff time and the resources to minimize these coordinate definitions. And the third uh, recommendation is there might be commercial or financial reasons to restrict access to data. Finally, there might be commercial or financial reasons uh, to restrict access to data, including proprietary information or data which could be subse subsequently monetized by groups incorporating data into their analysis. And the fifth one, uh, individual researchers could be concerned that reanalysis of their data for alternative research questions might lead to contradictory conclusions from their original statistics analysis. Additionally, individual researchers could be concerned that reanalysis of their data for alternative research questions might lead to, may lead, uh, might lead to contradictory conclusions from their original statistic analysis and hence might be less willing to share their data. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Figen Hoja, for your very interesting and um, helpful um, uh, keynote speech. Um, this is, these are, of course, extremely relevant topics, which we at least try to include in our uh, Pandavita project. And mm -hmm. uh, in the um, next two panels, we will talk a little bit deeper about that. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this was an extremely suitable overview. And uh, thank you very much again. Thank you very much for your invitation. <laughs> uh, Figueroa, I heard uh, you have to leave quite early. Yes, so therefore, uh, maybe... Uh, I have a, uh, I have a, a trip uh, at around 11.30. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. um, of course, I understand we, are, we appreciate that you are here. Maybe we can have, uh, together with um, Zelda, um, a, f a photo. Um, Aiden? 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 Uh, uh, we, we want to make a um, photo already now with uh, Figenhoja, please. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you too. Ladies and gentlemen, now um, we would like to start the third panel of the conference, the first panel for today, which uh, we call the Digitality in Pandemic Communication Processes. And uh, this is a panel where we would like to give you, we would like to present you an overview over our 
um, Pandavita project. Ne? So the heart, the core of our Pandavita project was the development of a Pandavita app and an, um, a Pandavita dashboard. And therefore, I'm happy to um, welcome now Mrs. Alba um, Gallego. Um, she is part, um, uh, one of our partners from the Universitat Politecnica de Madrid. And I would like to introduce her shortly. She works currently as a uh, research and development engineer at the Polytechnical University of Madrid and specifically within the Life Supporting Technology Research Group. Her professional background encompasses um, expertise in the domains of mobile and web application developments as well as project management with a specific focus on active and health, um, health aging. Mrs. Gallego um, has actively contributed to various European projects under the Horizon 2020 initiative, including Plan for Act, OCAR IOT, I hope it's okay. Gatekeeper, and of course Pandavita. <laughs> and she's talk, uh, she uh, will talk now about um, the Pandavita dashboard, a web-based tool to empower quadruplex collaboration and knowledge transfer in pandemic crisis. Alba, the floor is yours. sound we need to check you once again sorry Yes. So, <laughs> as I was saying, uh, as we most of us uh, know, during the pandemic crisis, the response time becomes critical. So, we need to provide, the, provide decision makers with easy to use tools that uh, facilitate the access to reliable information to accelerate the decision making process and reduce the spread of the virus, reducing also its socioeconomic impact and as is its health impact. 
Uh, on the other hand, another key problem during the pandemic is that people um, uh, say that they receive information that was insufficient, incoherent or difficult to contrast. So, as a result, they started to search for more information on the internet, where a lot of fake information is available. So, in the Pandevita project, uh, we have um, taken into account all these problems that derived from the COVID-19 situation, uh, all the requirements coming from the users, and also all the usability, security, and privacy uh, requirements. So, we have developed, conceptualized it, and designed it, the Pandevita dashboard. A, web, a powerful web-based application available in different languages whose main uh, difference among the other tools created during the pandemic is that it considers the full system of the quadruple helix, whose cooperation is essential for a good management of the, of, the, of the crisis. So, regarding the methodology that we have used to implement the Pandevita dashboard, uh, we have used the software development lifecycle, which is a user-centered uh, methodology. Uh, this methodology is divided in, in seven main phases, as we can see in this slide, and the first phase uh, is one of the most important, because uh, we extract all the requirements coming from the end user and the main user needs. Uh, and for that, we have used the user story methodology. Then, uh, the technical team, uh, using the Bodere methodology, extracted, uh, converted all these um, requirements into uh, technical functionalities and made the feasibility study. And with the final uh, functionalities defined, we started the design and prototyping uh, of the tool using the tool called Figma. Then, for the, de for the development, we have used the framework Angular, and with, when we have all the functionalities, the main functionalities developed, we have started the testing phase. And for that, we have used the, managing, uh, error, the error managing tool, call it Sentry. After testing all the functionality, we have started uh, the deployment, and for that, we have used the, 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 um, the different set, the hosting services um, from Firebase. And finally, we are in the last phase, which is the maintenance, uh, and for that, we, have used it, we are using Google Analytics and also Sendry. Also, it is important to remark that uh, during the, the four first phases, we have uh, implemented the Pandevita platform and also all the services that will be used, well, currently we are using um, in the Pandevita dashboard and also in the Pandevita application. So what is the main results obtained after applying all these uh, methodologies? Well, the first uh, result, obviously, is the Pandevita dashboard. Currently, we have launched the third version of this uh, tool, and we have used this uh, version for the piloting phase of the Pandevita dashboard, uh, of the Pandevita project, sorry. Um, in the Pandevita dashboard, to meet all the objectives, we have created four roles, which are mapped with the four system of the quadruple helix system, as we can see in this slide, and also we have different uh, functionalities presented in also in this, uh, in this slide on the left. So the first one is created to um, uh, accelerate the decision-making process and also um, to generate social awareness. In this, in this one, uh, the, real data the real data section, we can find information related to the current status of the COVID-19 situation and also uh, from the different uh, restrictions that each country has in each, uh, in each moment. Uh, then in the, in the comparative tool, uh, users can, compare the can see the evolution of different health uh, parameters and also different uh, socioeconomic parameters, as we can see here. And also they can analyze how the health parameters has impacted, have impacted in the, health param in the socioeconomic parameters. And finally, they can uh, see, they can analyze the different uh, results uh, coming uh, from a study uh, performed during this uh, project that will be presented in the next slot, so I will go to the next uh, functionality. The next one is the official documents. Documents in this section is uh, has been created because users during the pandemic uh, say that they have difficulties to find the information that the uh, uh, country's responsibility is um, uh, presented. So, uh, in this functionality, politicians or um, public authorities should include this information in a very simple way. They only have to include the link to the official document in the official website and also the title. So, as a result, users only have to click on this link um, and will be redirected to the official website with the official documents. 
The next one is one of the most important ones because during the pandemic, uh, citizens claim for information endorsed it by scientists instead of endorsed it by politicians. So uh, we have created the new section. In this section, users can create content, can cr generate content from very different uh, topics and in different languages. To ensure the reliability of these uh, news, of these articles, uh, we have uh, created the verification site. The, the verification section, sorry. So scientists uh, or academicians should validate every single um, uh, article. And at only if at least 50% plus one uh, uh, academicians has approved the, um, the article, it will be available, it will be approved and will be available for all the users. And the result is in this slide. This is the news section with only um, news uh, approved by all the um, academicians. With, well, with at least 50% plus one uh, votes. So in this, uh, in the news section, um, we can see the um, different kind of uh, filters. Also, they can search users can search for specific keywords. Uh, they can see uh, the um, the title and also a summary of the article in the original language and the, on English. And finally, they can uh, save the article into favorite. Uh, the next uh, one, the frequently asked questions section, has been created to uh, include all the relevant information related to the uh, pandemic into a single um, section. So here users can find for information related to the COVID-19. For example, how it is spread, uh, which are the um, which are the main um, diseases that has been have been um, um, affected by the COVID-19. Uh, also, how, how can I how I should act if I have uh, if I'm pregnant or if I have uh, children and so on. So here, uh, people can find uh, 70 um, more than 70 um, questions and answers related to different. Uh, things related to the COVID-19 and also they can search for specific keyword that will be appear in the description uh, in the answer or also in the question and the next one is um, is uh, the relation with the other tool relate, uh, created uh, in the context of the Pandevita project which is the Pandevita application in this uh, section users can find a general overview of the status of the application and also if they have a player in the in the application, they can see also their, pro, their status. So, as we have seen, this is the last uh, uh, section of the Pandevita dashboard. Um, and as we, can, uh, as we can see, uh, we can meet all the objectives of the Pandevita project, and also we have met all the um, all the uh, requirements coming from all the requests coming from the end users, uh, defined at the start of the project, in a very with this uh, with this tool. And also, it is important to highlight that we are also uh, complying with the GDPR through the privacy policy and also with the consent form and different uh, metrics and, and uh, tools that we have used. The other relevant, um, the other relevant result that we have obtained from uh, applying all this methodology is the Pandevita Data Lake. The Pandevita Data Lake is uh, divided in two parts. Uh, it uh, contains information. It contains information coming from external data sources, and also uh, the information generated through the use of the Pandevita dashboard and Pandevita application. In the case of the information that comes from uh, external data sources, we need this information because, as we have seen in the previous slides, uh, the Pandevita dashboard contains information related to the COVID-19 situation, restrictions, indicators. Uh, and also uh, frequently asked questions. So for that, uh, we have to, uh, this is one of the key challenges of the project, because we have to analyze different databases open uh, on internet um, and analyze if they are reliable or not, if they, have, if they include all the information and parameters that we need uh, to meet all the objectives of the project and also the requirements coming from the users. And at, it, at this second stage, uh, we can uh, select which are the databases that we that meet all the all the needs. And the third uh, phase is uh, the implementation of different services that uh, are in charge of extracting the data from the original data sources, uh, translate the original data model to the Pandevita data model, and then upload this information and also make all this process automatic. So every day, the, all this information is uh, updated automatically in the Pandevita dashboard and in the Pandevita data lake. 
So here in this slide we can see uh, some of the some example of the databases that we have used, external databases, for example, or Walling Data, uh, uh, WHO, or OECD. Um, although during the uh, focus group that we have uh, performed during the Pandevita project, we received uh, very positive comments uh, to uh, and the willingness of people to participate and to use this tool in future pandemic. We think that we can uh, include and improve some of the features uh, to create a most robust uh, application for future pandemics. So this is uh, an, an example of the improvements that we can include, for example, improve the review process, including uh, reviewers' categories to reduce the number of verifications that each reviewer should do, highlight academy users with more than 10 publications as relevant academy users as a reward mechanism, include a button so academicians can, repo can report which users are creating fake content, or extend, for example, to municipalities. Because, but this one depends on having this information because currently we don't have access to, to this information. And now the big question is how we can adapt this tool for future pandemic events. So in this slide we can see the, um, the data model of the Pandevita dashboard. As we can see, it's very general, the word COVID-19 doesn't appear because uh, all this information is general and can be applicable to other uh, future pandemics. It is re uh, information related to epidemiological data, socioeconomic data, news, restrictions, official document, the registration, and also the frequently asked questions. And also it is important to remark that this data model that is used by the Pandevita dashboard also can be extended and include new parameters that can be used for future pandemics. So in the worst case, which is that um, a, a country need, wanted to, wants to include this dashboard to manage the pandemic and they don't have access to the information, they only, ha they only, have, to and they only have to analyze all the data sources available, select all the uh, data sources that uh, contains the variable that we need and also are reliable, then adapt the services uh, to adapt the original data model because now it's different than the original data source and finally make some adaptations to the uh, dashboard because now in the dashboard in the translations of the dashboard it appears the word COVID-19 so this is some of the changes that we have to include but as we can as we can see uh, here uh, it is a very few a very um, a a big process in all the process of the creation and the conceptualization of the entire um, uh, pandemic dashboard. Only four weeks in all, one year that we we take to creating all this tool, as it is uh, currently. So, in conclusions, uh, uh, throughout this presentation, I, uh, we have seen, we have examined the, the process of creating, the entire process of creating a tool like the Pandevita dashboard to meet all the objectives of the Pandevita project and also uh, the requirements coming from the, from the users, the requests coming from the users during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Creating a tool like the Pandevita dashboard, which is uh, robust, which is secure, which is reliable, um, is a first starting point, it's a very interesting first starting point that we have uh, to take into account to future pandemic crisis because um, it um, enhances the communication and the cooperation among the different members of the quadruple helix uh, and also uh, reduce the spread of fake news and so on, as I said before. So, in summary, the Pandevita dashboard uh, helps to maintain people well informed and, and also to make um, informed decisions based on reliable data with the main aim of protecting uh, people's safety and health. This is all from my side. Thanks uh, a lot for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Alma, for uh, introducing our Pandavita dashboard. Um, as you can understand, the innovative aspect of our dashboard is that um, the public is not only reduced on 
asking questions, reading information with other people, especially scientists give, they can contribute with their own knowledge and which, was, uh, which is um, evaluated by the scientific community um, to avoid misinformation. And um, thank you very much uh, for your um, um, uh, kind introduction. Um, maybe you realized inside of the abstract book there are some flyers um, and on these flyers there is the link to the dashboard and um, a link to um, ev evaluation tool. If you um, would like to, we would appreciate very much when you uh, contribute with, with your opinion about that and you uh, participate to our pilot. Now I would like to introduce you another partner from us, um, uh, Sotiris um, the Gift Top Topolus. Um, he is from uh, our partner um, EAMBES, um, which is uh, the headquarters is um, located in Brussels, but he is in fact um, from Greece. He was born in Komotini in northern Greece in 1982 and graduated from the computer science department of University of Crete in 2003. Um, he received his master's degree from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the Democritus uh, University of Trey, Trake, Trey, Trace, sorry, <laughs> and defended his PhD thesis entitled Analysis of Influence on a Social uh, Network under the advisory of Professor Pavlos Ephraimides in 2022. During his um, uh, doctoral um, studies, he was involved in multiple research uh, projects uh, that focus on the field of social network analysis and influence, uh, influence um, diffusions in social networks. At the moment, he is postdoc researcher at the Department of Informatics at the Union University and an approved to be a scientist associate of Athena Research Center. And now he will talk about a Twitter-based analysis of the interaction between the public and the pharmaceutical companies. I'm happy to have you here. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So, well, for this very, very interesting conference and this panel that gives us the opportunity to present the outcomes of our result. So, my presentation is entitled The Twitter Based Analysis of the interaction between the public and the pharmaceutical companies. And during uh, our procedures in our project, we had the opportunity to analyze uh, and to focus the interaction between prominent pharmaceutical companies and the public. And this was our chance to examine the interaction between members of the scientific community, such as pharmaceutical scientists, with all the other members of the quadruple helix, that is the media and cultural based public, politics, and economy. So we, said, we thought that it would be very interesting to examine how this interaction took place in a prominent uh, online social network uh, such as Twitter. We posed some questions in order to see and to clarify exactly what we should examine. So we asked ourselves, what were the characteristics of the communication between the public and these prominent pharmaceutical companies? that are members of the scientific community. Furthermore, what were the snippets, the quotes, the tweets that were mostly circulated in the network? And furthermore, if we proceed to a sentimental analysis of these uh, posts, of these tweets, we were interested in seeing which were the dominant sentiments in this communication channel. So, we, as I mentioned before, we chose Twitter for our analysis, for our basis, for our source of data in the analysis of uh, the communication channel. So, why Twitter? Well, first and foremost, Twitter is one of the most prominent online social networks currently operating worldwide, with worldwide coverage that can contribute uh, significant, significantly in the scientific research. Uh, furthermore, the functionality of Twitter as was the case before Elon Musk took control of Twitter, was uh, available and we could extract tractable information regarding the interaction between users uh, on the social network. Furthermore, there are several fruitful results in other scientific results and in other scientific researches in various fields such as political analysis or other crisis analysis. And the final and foremost, there are state-of-the-art algorithms that can be used and are especially developed for analyzing data extracted from Twitter, either in sentiment analysis or in context analysis. 
So, first we retrieved data from Twitter, the prominent, for prominent pharmaceutical companies. We uh, gathered more than 200 pharmaceutical companies active on Twitter, handling more than 600 accounts on the social network, and we thought that it would be better if we extract both their COVID-related context as well as their non-COVID-related context. So we have two channels, the non-COVID-related context as well as the COVID-19-related context. And spe specifically for the COVID-19-related context, we also extracted the public's response in order to examine how these users, these operators in the networks, uh, responded to the actions of the pharmaceutical companies. During our research, we were able to, to extract from a period, for the period during March 2020 till September 22, more than 366 thousands of posts of tweets that are related to the non-COVID-19 channel and more than 65 thousands of posts in the COVID-19 channel. Of course, these are multilingual, so we have to we had to uh, filter these posts, these snippets, for the English posts that we could analyze uh, efficiently. The public's response to these two channels, especially to the COVID-19 channel, was more than one million reactions. It spread it and distributed throughout the whole period of March 2020 till September 2022. And as you can see in the distribution of the activity of the pharmaceutical companies in this period, you can see that there is, uh, in the beginning, some low activity in the non-COVID-19 channel, and then the activity continues as usual with several peaks at specific months. These peaks can be attributed to special events that took place and that are non-COVID-19 related, such as uh, the flu virus or other uh, information disseminated by the pharmaceutical companies. The more interesting part is in the beginning, which we can see that there is a decline in the activity um, of the pharmaceutical companies, a phenomenon that can be easily explained when you, we see the activity of the pharmaceutical companies in the COVID-19 channel, in the COVID-19 context. You can see that in the beginning of the pandemic, that is the March and April of 2020, we can see a very large peak in the activity, the, the pharmaceutical companies were really active in that period. And you can see that they disseminated many original tweets, they quoted a lot, and they replied also a lot. A lot. I should note that uh, in our study we excluded the retweets activities of the pharmaceutical companies since the retweet activities are attributed to the original source, which may be not which may not be a pharmaceutical company. So you can see that in the beginning of the pandemic, the pharmaceutical companies were really active. Actually, in the first months, the pharmaceutical companies were more active in the COVID-19 channel than in the non-COVID-19 channel. That signifies their uh, presence in this channel and their um, struggle to inform people and to disseminate good news or whatever news they had at the moment. But when we see the public's activity, we see a completely different landscape. We can see that in the beginning of the pandemic, the public chose to be active in the COVID-19 channel. Then there was a small decline and there were some really big peaks of their activity in the, later, in the um, following months, especially in the summer of um, 2021 and in spring of 2021, as well as in November and uh, January of 2022 we can see that the public responded differently to the activity of the pharmaceutical companies. And that gave us um, the incentive that at that time period, there must have been something really crucial going on in the public, for the public interest, something that the pharmaceutical companies did not take into account. So we proceeded with a context analysis of the tweets of both the pharmaceutical companies and of the public. So you can see that mainly, the concern of both the pharmaceutical companies and of the public are, as, are, main, are focused on the vaccination rollout or the vaccines that are, were under development. These are the most frequently words and hashtags throughout the whole period in our research from March 2020 till September 2022. But uh, there is also a large table which shows per month the most 
we frequently use the words of the public and of the pharmaceutical companies, we could see in this analysis that in several months where there were peaks in the public's activity, there were concerns regarding the pandemic in India, specifically in the spring of 2021, and there were also some um, uh, top hashtags and top um, uh, frequently wor used words regarding the rollout of specific vac vaccines in India and uh, their application on children, when uh, there was a, a discussion of whether these vaccines should be applied to children. Ma furthermore, the other, other themes, other subjects were also crucial at some point, you could see at some point, well, you cannot see it here, but uh, we have removed, we could find some peaks and some um, has bombing, hashtag bombings in this channel when other users use this channel to promote their agenda. You could, we cannot see, we could see it in our data, which were excluded since they are not um, related to the COVID-19, that in March and in May, uh, in February and March of 2022, there were the most prominent hashtag was Russia, that was correlated to the um, war in Russia. So uh, we could examine, we could see that the hashtag analysis and the word analysis really uh, show us clear indication of what the public's interests were at the moment and what should be taken into account. This would also be re really clear when we proceed with a sentimental analysis of these posts. We chose to analyze the posts and to extract the feelings that are conveyed in these messages using a state-of-the-art algorithm that uses Ekman's classification scheme, and we were able to extract factors for these posts regarding six sentiments. The sentiments of anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, and surprise. And whenever there was no sentiment detectable in the posts, we were assigning this post as neutral, as neutral uh, posts. We could assign them as the neutral factor. Well, here we can see the average sentiment both in the non-COVID-19 channel and in the COVID-19 channel. We can see that they are more or less the same with uh, small variations. We can see that there is a lot of joy disseminated by the pharmaceutical companies. This is the post of the pharmaceutical companies, disseminated by the pharmaceutical companies in the non-COVID-19 channel. And there is also uh, similar almost joy content, joyful content in the COVID-19 channel. There is also a great power of neutral content. It is 32.54% in the non-COVID-19 channel and it's 36.68% in the, the COVID-19 channel. There is some surprise present, both in the non-COVID-19 channel and the COVID-19 channel, and there is some fear also detectable in these channels. It is from 7.55% in the non-COVID-19 channel to 9%. 0.48 in the COVID-19 channel, we can see a small increase in the sentiment of fear, as well in the sentiment of sadness and the small detectable um, variation in anger. The situation is completely different, or almost completely different, to the sentiments when we examine the sentiment of the public. We can see that the sentiments of joy is significantly decreased, and the sentiments of surprise, fear, and sadness are also increased. That's showing, this is to indicate that the public concerns were also detectable and traceable in the online social network. We could see with, through an algorithmic approach that we could uh, detect the sentiments and the anger, the anger and the fear of the public as expressed in their posts. These posts of the public were further analyzed and to see how they responded to the pharmaceutical companies' posts when they were categorized per sentiment. So in our analysis, we took the pharmaceutical companies' posts and categorized them based on our findings in these four basic categories, fear, joy, surprise, and neutral. You could ask yourself why are the other sentiments missing, the sentiments of disgust, of anger, of, of, uh, and of, um, uh, I can recall, of sadness. These sentiments are missing. Well, these sentiments were not um, very high in our analysis, and we could not detect 
large amounts of data that could be categorized in, this, um, uh, in these classes. So we chose not to include them as uh, they were uh, close to a statistical error. So we categorized the pharmaceutical companies' posts in these categories. You can see the size of the categories per class, per sentimental class, by the pharmaceutical companies. And you can see also the reactions they triggered in the public. The reactions of the public include the public's retweets, uh, quotes, and replies. And also, you can see the ratio of, its public, its, um, of the public's response to its post in the, the in the sentimental class of the pharmaceutical companies. Here, the most stri striking result, the most striking finding, is that the classes of fear and joy have the highest ratio in their response, ra the response ratio for the users. That is, each post in these two classes, in the classes of fear and the classes of joy, uh, triggered the reaction of averagely 56 or 57 users online on the social network. While in the classes of surprise and neutral, the numbers are quite lower, 37 and 30 uh, reactions per post. Furthermore, if we see the classes, specific classes of joy and fear, we can see that in the class of joy, there was a highest retweet ratio. So the users chose to retweet posts po uh, disseminated by the pharmaceutical companies, companies that conveyed joyful content. And retweet actually is uh, an action that means that you want to spread the news and to let your followers and your friends see happy news, but it's also an effortless, um, an effortless uh, action. It's something that you don't need to take too much into consideration. You just push the tweet, retweet button, and this action is then uh, activated on the social network. On the other hand, in the class of fear, of fear we can see that there is a high reply and quote rate uh, in, when compared with the joy class. Well, the quote rate is almost identical, but the reply rate is uh, significantly elevated, closes close to five replies per tweet of fear. That's signifying the, uh, the, 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 the urge of the public to respond to the posts of fear disseminated by the pharmaceutical companies. So, there is also more interesting results that you, you can find in the already published work of this analysis. But as a conclusion, we can see that the lessons learned from this analysis can be summarized, summarized into these three bullets, which are the following. First of all, we have to listen to the public concerns. And this is significantly depicted in the distribution of the activity of the public and the comparison with the, dis with the distribution of activity of the pharmaceutical companies. We could see that the public were interested in expressing themselves in periods when the pharmaceutical companies uh, withheld their news. Second, we have to disseminate sentiment aware messages. What do we mean by sentiment aware messages? Sentiment, said messages that convey uh, sentiments that can easily promote themselves. We saw that the classes of fear and of joy had the highest um, retweet or quote or reply ratio. So maybe in a future crisis we should choose to make strong sentimental content in our sen in our posts and strong in a positive way, in an optimistic way, that could be more easily circulated throughout the network. So stronger sentiments lead to broader circulation. The sentiments of neutral and the sentiments of surprise were not circulated uh, at all. So these are the lessons learned from our analysis. You can find more interesting results in our published publication. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sotiris, for your um, very um, important and um, interesting, interesting results. What we can learn from that is, and, and this is one of our approaches, 
um, that when we want to talk about and uh, understand the knowledge production in the system society, at that moment we have to include sentiments, and this makes the, um, the system, of course, very um, complex, because at that moment we have to understand, maybe we have to rethink the aspect of misinformation as well. We come now to um, another partner of um, us, um, Ani Karin Salo from, uh, from the VTT uh, Technical Research Center of Finland. And um, she was the one, um, or the, her team was the one who created the Pandavita app. I want to, um, uh, to uh, f uh, point you also, there is another flyer inside of the um, abstract book uh, with a link to the app and the link to the um, online form. So please, if you can, it would be super when you um, would um, uh, attend to our pilot. I would like to um, introduce Anni Karinsalo. She is, as I said, working in the, as a senior scientist at VTT um, Technical Research Center of Finland in the Applied Cryptography team. She has, experience, um, has experiences um, from both practical and academic cybersecurity work such as post-quantum uh, cryptography, applying distributed ledgers and improving privacy issues. She has participated in several international projects and has been a member, of a num a, uh, member in a number of working groups such as privacy protection group led by Finnish Privacy Commissioner and um, Ideas um, Working Group of Finland. Now she is talking about a mobile application and enabling a pandemic ed uh, education and um, tracking a zero trust evaluation. Ani, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Dear audience, it's a really a pleasure to be presenting you today our project results. As I said, my name is Anni Karinsala. I work for the Applied Cryptography team at uh, VTT Research, Technical Research Center of Finland, Oulu. And my uh, topic today is to uh, present our mobile application for enabling pandemic education and tracking and uh, provide a zero trust evaluation for it. So, my presentation content today is, um, first I will be um, presenting some work background and motivation for our work. Then I will uh, present the Pandavita app functionalities. Uh, I will shortly go through the Zero Trust concept, what it means. And uh, then I will uh, explain what the Zero Trust concept means uh, from the mobile app point of view. And finally, I will give recommendations uh, for the Pandavita app for the development. So uh, this, our work uh, is done together with uh, from VTT, Ada Illikainen and uh, Pekka Koskela. And the whole application uh, work is based on the co-creation with the whole Pandavita team together. This is our uh, common, common work. As motivation, so um, uh, as the Pandavita scope was to improve accurate knowledge transfer between science and society uh, in the form of science-based science recommendation and decision processes. So we uh, recognized a need for a tool to educate and minimize the negative effects of uh, pandemics as well as enable communication uh, between science and, and, and society. As a result, we uh, managed to uh, develop our Pandavita apl application uh, uh, as well as, of course, the, the platform that uh, Alba presented earlier. Uh, uh, Pandavita application is now ready. It is uh, uh, existing in Apple Store and Google Play and you are uh, free to uh, download it and test it. Uh, and it consists of several features aimed to improve uh, communication and education in pandemic-like situation. Uh, and it, it uses, uh, for instance, gamification features. Uh, and the actual features uh, include news, news display that is using the uh, Pandavita platform, uh, GPS-based based, um, educational game and quizzes. So, uh, first of all, a uh, user has to re re register uh, for the application. 
and it's possible for either the citizen or academia re representative. Uh, of our further versions uh, can provide even more various role-specific functionalities. Uh, and uh, the, the registration is confirmed via email. So our educational game is a, a game based on user location uh, utilizing GPS tracking. So uh, the user uh, collects points uh, by vaccine and mask and uh, uh, tries to avoid viruses and collects points by this. Uh, and the user can, can create group for a game and compete against others in this game. Then there is the news section that I explained that uh, utilizes the platform. Uh, uh, so users can view uh, the pandemic related news and news are uh, provided by the dashboard and are reviewed by the academic users and this way uh, it is uh, the users can be certain that the news are reliable for the for them to read. Another functionality is the quiz. Uh, which is uh, provided for the citizen by the uh, academia. So uh, this, uh, this way citizens may be able to test and improve their knowledge about uh, the current issues on, the, on pandemics. And of course, it can, can be enlarged to, to include other, other sub subjects, uh, other crises uh, as well. So, uh, we wanted to uh, evaluate the, the application with the, using the zero trust concept. So uh, what I uh, explained that uh, zero, trust, zero trust concept is a general uh, arch arch architecture concept based on the philosophy that uh, never trust, always verify. And it sounds very bad, but actually <laughs> uh, this means that uh, the, the system will be sec security verified, which, me which means, of course, that uh, there is increased sec security and privacy for the user. Which that uh, in um, with, uh, which then means that a user, user can actually trust the system more. So um, uh, for the uh, regarding the framework, uh, National Institute uh, of Standards and Technology has uh, defined seven general tenets that we uh, have applied for the mobile world. So this is a very technical picture, but uh, um, uh, in the, the box uh, uh, in uh, security management, you can see the four uh, functions that can be um, uh, applied uh, in the mobile world. Uh, namely, they are software root of trust, uh, authentication and authorization, um, security updates and audit, and uh, monitoring and security system um, automation. automation. So shortly, uh, the root of trust uh, is actually a foundational concept in computer security that refers to the trustworthy and secure starting point uh, of a computing system. So what it does is it establishes a chain of, chain of trust that ensures the security of the system components, for instance, the applications. So. Uh, for, uh, in, the, in a case of mobile applications, this root of trust can be formed either, either locally or, out, out, or outside of a uh, device. So uh, local root of trust can be uh, utilized uh, these kinds of secure execution areas, such as uh, trusted execution exec environments and so on. And outside trust is, uh, is usually based on credentials pro provided by some certificate authority, for instance, Apple or Google. Or Google. <coughs> and the authentication and authorization, uh, in this case, the main uh, principle is uh, that uh, application should use just those resources that is uh, needed for its functioning. So, so no other resources should be available, available for uh, application. And uh, it, would be beneficial to, go ha to have, for instance, continuous 
but adap adaptive user and application authentication and authorization according to users' privilege. For this, the users and uh, their applications would need a unique, unique identifiers which are bound to the existing root of trust, which I was explaining earlier. So any software updates are of co course um, that are received should be free from any kind of malicious code. So uh, for instance, Google and Apple have some kind of checks for this, but they are not 100% uh, proof. Uh, and uh, there are techniques such as sandboxing that can be used for ap uh, applications to s uh, isolate them from each other, uh, as well as the operating system. And there are some uh, open source audit tools available. And of course, remote attestation is a technique th that can be used uh, for integrity assurance, which is normally used for uh, platform kind of assurance. <coughs> then we have secu security monitoring. Uh, uh, of course, we have to be sure that there are no security incidences. They are always potential. So mobile environment would benefit of continuous, continuous, continuous monitoring and automated security management. Uh, and then for this, there are several open source uh, uh, tools available. And one option is to utilize AI, AI, AI aided systems. Mm. So Finally, uh, um, uh, using uh, these uh, tenets, we recomm make recommendations for Pandavita application further development. Uh, as I explained, to uh, enable different cryptographic operations, uh, for instance, authentication, encryption, integrity, verification, and so on, there is a need for root of trust. Mm. Pandavita application uses rules of trust uh, based on certificates uh, of platform providers, uh, Apple, and Apple and Google at the moment. But however, it can be possible uh, to build a rule of trust locally uh, in the device. Uh, advantage of this would be that there is no dependency on third party services and uh, connections outside the device. And it ha would have a smaller attack, attack service surface. Uh, and from zero trust point of view, the local ID would also be preferred because it would reduce vulnerability, vulnerability surface uh, compared to the uh, uh, cloud-based that is outsider uh, root of trust. Okay, within these words, I uh, conclude my um, speech and thank you for the attention. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Ali, for this um, uh, introduction of our um, Pandavita app and additionally also the, the um, security concept. Um, this is very important. And again, I would like to make advertisement. Use this app. You with the apps are available in the, in the Google Play Store and the link for the Apple version is um, written on the flyer what I showed you. Now I would like to give the floor to my very young uh, colleague of mine from the Bilken team, Ilmak Dündar. Um, we are working together in two Horizon projects beside the Horizon project Pandavita. We are uh, working also on a concept, on a project which deals with um, platformization and, um, uh, and Europeanization. And uh, Mark Dünder will give us a little bit insights of that. First, I would like to introduce her. She's graduated from uh, Ted Ankara College Foundation Private School in 2015 with an international um, bachelor diploma. After uh, completing her undergraduate edu education at Bilkent University Department of Economics in 2019, she received her master's degree from the Bilkent University Communication and Design Department Visual and Media Studies program in 2022. She has been working as a researcher in the European Commission Horizon project Pandavita, as I said, since the beginning of uh, 21 and in the European Commission Horizon project Jubiplatz since November 22. And now um, she gives us a um, speech about with a title, Opinion or Knowledge, a study on distinguished health related information in Turkish social media posting during COVID-19 pandemic. Irma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ozan. Um, 
Hello all. Um, today I'm going to talk about a research that we made for the Yumi Plat project and uh, our research's title is Opinion or Knowledge, a study on distinguishing health-related information in Turkish social media posts during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, first of all, I would like to start my speech by um, giving some information about what Yumi Plat project is. The uh, Yumi Plat project is funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 uh, Research and Innovation Program and aims to analyze the role of media platforms in fostering or dismantling European identity. Um, drawing on the assumption that European dimension has rarely been dominant in media history and focusing on the platformization process and its positive and negative externalities. The main research question of the um, UMIPLAT project is whether or not new platforms are making European culture more European or not. If it is considered that there is a correlation between the education level of a society and their will and urge to um, receive uh, true knowledge, uh, it is very important to uh, consider who and what kind of institutions are making um, what kind of opinions, information and knowledge out to the public. Um, besides determining the trustworthiness of Turkish social media posts, the comments under these posts hold um, importance for understanding the relation between opinion and knowledge. Uh, the comments under specific uh, posts will be analyzed as well as the uh, posts that I will give some examples of. Um, in this research, COVID-19 related uh, health data of UMIPLAT project is studied in terms of opinion-based knowledge concept. The data consists of uh, top 10 Facebook posts with uh, most interactions between September to November 2021. Um, these posts, uh, as well as the comment section, are categorized as opinion, information or knowledge and explanations are given on why and how some posts or uh, comments uh, are contributing to opinion-based knowledge processes. Um, with all these things in mind, uh, we used qualitative content analysis uh, methods, um, having the quintuple helix at our heart. Um, to remind what uh, Quintuple Helix was, um, it involves representations, uh, representatives from all members of the society, which are um, public authorities, uh, industry, academia, citizens and environment. Uh, the study mostly focuses on the relationship between uh, the um, citizens as public and the uh, knowledge making processes, but it shouldn't be forgotten that, forgotten that um, the posts that we handled are actually very much about polit politics and also uh, media. Um, and also, the, uh, I should give you the hypothesis of our uh, research. The main hypothesis is that public does contribute to the knowledge making processes by making uh, opinion based knowledge. Knowledges. Or, um, from the early ages, we uh, know that it was a vital, ver um, vital urge of people to reach to the knowledge. Um, and some ancient philosopher philosophers uh, really focused their attention on. Uh, solving like worldly matters and some really uh, focused their attention on the uh, human-based micro um, problems let's say. Uh, for uh, Socrates, Plato and last but not least Aristotle, um, knowing it was a very uh, important um, like word uh, and uh, for Socrates the only uh, good as knowledge. For Plato, knowledge is attainable and that knowledge must be infallible and of the real. And for Aristotle, the object of knowledge must be objectively true and necessary. It must be subjectively be seen as necessary. The true cause has to be known and the necessity of the casual connection must be perceived. Um, in the modern day, however, we make the distinction between opinion and knowledge very concretely. If we consider opinion as a thought or belief about something or someone, uh, we say knowledge is awareness, understanding or information that has been obtained by experience or study that is either in a person's mind or possessed by people generally. Uh, knowledge is attained by evidence-based experiences, uh, but uh, however, we should keep in mind that um, knowledge is also attained by uh, opinion-based experiences. 
Now I would like to give you some of our examples from our um, research and this uh, first example is from Hurriyet's uh, official uh, Facebook page uh, and it says uh, in the post uh, from the worst to best in the epidemic there is no one left to vaccine in Portugal. Uh, so um, thinking that this um, Hurriyet um, newspaper is a very litigious uh, one in Turkey. Uh, probably uh, the link is uh, given below, by the way, uh, to it directs directly to the um, official web page of Hurriyet and the whole news article is given there. Um, after this Facebook post, uh, I saw a um, comment that said Portugal has a population of 10.5 million with uh, 490 cases today. We have eight times the population of Portugal, meaning Turkey. So today's number of cases multiplied by eight makes 4,000 people. If we had vaccinated 98% over the age of 18, like them, like Portugal, we would have dropped to around four to 5,000 per day. This comment in particular is very important in my opinion because uh, this is a direct example of uh, opinion-based uh, knowledge. It, um, the opinion is given by the commentator is revealing numbers and mathematical calculations uh, and assumptions based on math makes the opinion uh, based comments uh, an opinion based knowledge case. The second example is not very uh, far away from the first one. Again, this is a post from Hurriyet's official Facebook uh, web page and again the uh, link directs uh, to the uh, official uh, news article. The um, translation of the post itself is new epidemic alarm in Europe and Asia, 25 uh, times more deadly than Corona. Um, the title itself can be suspicious since COVID uh, was the biggest issue as of those days. Uh, the news title states an information rather than solid knowledge. However, uh, when we look at uh, one of the comments under the post, you can see that once again, opinions and information mix together and create an opinion-based knowledge. The uh, comment right here is translated as bird flu has been threatening humanity since 1878, but the death rate is less than COVID. It just gets attention because it spreads faster. Mashallah, you keep shouting like a doomsdayer. As people get scared, let the negative mood in the markets continue to rise. While the rich get richer, let the poor sink to the rock bottom. In the black hole where you drag humanity with this fear policy all over the world, people are more afraid. May God heal you first. As you can see, this uh, very emotional comment is uh, very much um, heavily influenced by this person's opinions. But you can also see that uh, he or she is giving some facts and uh, making this opinion uh, an opinion-based knowledge case. My third and last uh, example for today is um, made by um, an author, Abdullah Chifchi, and uh, this is the only example that we have from our data set which uh, is posted just by a person. The others are always posted by a um, news source or newspapers. Um, so, in this post, he encourages people to go watch his YouTube video about the new variant of COVID-19, the Omicron. Uh, and in the link, uh, when you click it, you can directly go to the YouTube page and he, uh, for 30 minutes straight, he talks about the new variant and his previous uh, opinions about how uh, COVID-19 cases will uh, go to some places or what will happen to the COVID-induced uh, um, uh, public and uh, he's also saying that some of his opinions became reality at the end of the day. So this is also a very, um, in my opinion, great example of opinion-based knowledge uh, processes. I don't want to continue that much with the examples because uh, we have limited time, but I would like to go to the conclusions. Uh, in the end of the research, we found that Turkish social media users state their opinions clearly in the comment sections uh, of the posts, and uh, they really don't um, like get shy or they just really like to express themselves. Uh, opinions of people in the comment sections have direct relation with information and knowledge production. Uh, with accordance to the quintuple helix, people engage themselves with knowledge production through their opinions. And last but not least, opinion-based knowledge production is available in the Turkish media as a general conclusion, we can say. And thank you for listening.
Yeah, thank you very much, Ilmak, for these um, your very, very um, uh, interesting um, um, uh, uh, presentation. It was really important, and um, this is what we could learn from both Horizon Project that um, what sounds a little bit contradictory, opinion-based knowledge is in fact um, um, a, a kind of knowledge what we ad identified, especially when we are talking about uncertain knowledge, which um, is um, uh, in COVID-19 for a long time the case. So thank you very much for um, your presentation. We would want um, uh, invite to invite you. Ah, sorry. Please, um, all panelists uh, come to the stage once again for a family photo, um, including uh, Guillermo, please, as well. And um, then after our family photos, um, I would like to invite you for 10 minutes coffee break. And um, then we continue with the um, next panel about legal perspectives in pandemic times. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, I see that we have new guests, Hosh Gelnis, and uh, welcome to the International Pandavita Conference. I'm happy to have you here, and we start now with our panel about legal perspective on pandemic times. I would like to introduce and welcome now um, Mr. Hikmek uh, Kanuk. Um, he was born uh, in 1968 in um, Biyadich, Balak. Balukashir, sorry my pronunciation is very bad, I know. Um, after graduation from um, um, Bat, um, Balatle Primary School, um, Biyadich uh, uh, Secondary School and Jumhuriyet High School, he graduated from Ankara University Faculty of Law in 1998. Um, sorry, 1989. Um, he completed um, his uh, two-year ju um, juridical internship as a, a judge candidate in uh, Balikashir, um, started his professional career as a, um, a seared judge and uh, served as a, a judge um, for um, approximately 20 years um, as Pinabashe Kastamonu um, Shavash, uh, uh, Shavshat um, Artwin, Turgutlu, Manisa and Bursa judge respectively. Um, uh, he gave uh, lectures and um, release law um, at the Justice Academy and uh, organized training seminars on um, lease agreements and ad adaptation, eviction, and, uh, determination and compensation cases arising from these agreements at the Union of uh, Turkish Bar Association. Now we will talk about the evaluation of COVID-19 pandemics in terms of lease contracts um, in the um, ju uh, judiciary um, pand uh, uh, practices. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello. First of all, I would you like to thanks to organizations, Pandavita teams. I am Hikmet Kanuk, members of Third Civil Chambers of Turkey Supreme Court. The evaluations of the COVID pandemic in terms of lease agreements in the Court of Cassation practice. Lease agreement and its elements in the Turkish Code of Obligations. The elements of lease agreement List, rent, agreement. Obligations of the lesser. The lesser shall deliver the list to the tenant in accordance with its intended use and keep it in this condition for the duration of the lease. Two, be responsible for the defects that are present in the list or that appear later. Three, ancillary expenses, taxes, and similar liabilities incurred for the leased property. Obligations of the tenant. The tenant shall, one, use the list with care and respect the neighbors. Two, pay the rent. Three, pay the cleaning and maintenance expenses of the list. Four, not to feed the lesser of any defects in the list and endure their elimination. COVID-19 pandemic. In December 2019, it emerged in Wuhan, China. It was first seen in Turkey on March 10, 2020. As of March 11, 2020, it was described as a pandemic by the World Health Organization. In order to prevent the spread of the pandemic and reduce its impact, measures have been taken all over the world and in our country since the second half of March 2020. Measures taken in Turkey. One, measures taken through administrative decisions. Two, Measures taken through legal regulations. Result, 
due to the administrative and legal measures taken, the business and activities of tenants in workplace leases have been negatively affected. Tenants operating as businesses in leased workplaces subject to administrative provision become unable to use the lease in full or in part. Judicial deadlines for lease disputes have been suspended for a period of time. Review uh, of the Supreme Court decisions on workplace leases affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. One, the review of the judgment of the Third Civil Chamber of the Court of Cassation date June 4, 2021. Some businesses have been closed due to the COVID pandemic. The enterprises affected by these measures are mostly tenants. The lesser has the obligations to deliver the list to the tenant in accordance with it, its intended use and to ensure its use during the lease period. Tenants affected by the pandemic have filed an adaptation legal action demanding a reduction in rental prices. While the case was, was ongoing and in term injections was registered for discounted rent payments. This request was rejected by the court of first instance. The Bursa Regional Court of Appeal annulled the rejection decision of the first instance court and decided that the rent requested will be paid with a 50% discount during the COVID-19 pandemic and until the case in concluded without any appeal. The Ankara Regional Court of Appeal, on the other hand, rejected the appeal against the rejection decisions of the first instance court in another case. The judgments of the third civil chamber. Business tenants have been negatively affected by administrative measures or laws adopted to reduce the impact or prevent the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic until the lawsuits filed for the adaptation of the rental price are consolidated as a temporary legal protection, a prosecutory injection may be assured for reduced payment of rent. <laughs> Two, the judgment of the uh, third civil chamber of the Court of Cassation dated November 1, 2022. The plaintiff tenant operates as a wedding hall operator in the list premises rented from the defendant lesser. The tenant could not use the workplace due to COVID measures. The offer of discounted payment of the rent during the period when the last property <coughs> could not be fully used was not accepted by the lesser. An adaptation case was filed with the diamond for a reduction in rent. The judgment of the first instance court due to COVID-19, the court decided to make a percent discount on the rental price because the rented was used in a limited way. This decision was applied by the lesser. The judgment of the Ankara Regional Court of Appeal. It is written in the, in the contract that as long as the lease agreement continues, the tenant cannot request a reduction or adaptation of the rent for any reason whatsoever. Signs rents will be paid in such cases, even in case of, of force measure. It is not appropriate to reduce the rent due to the epidemic. The first instance court decisions has been lifted. The judgments of third civil chamber of the court of cassation, the lessor is obligated to deliver to list in a condition 
suitable for use and to keep it in this condition during the lease period. The basic principle in the performance of contracts is to comply with the contract. The tenant who has difficulties due to the ex extraordinary situation cannot be asked to stick to the contract. Lease agreements affected by the measures taken to prevent the COVID pandemic should be adapted by reducing the rental price. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hikmet uh, Kanik, for your um, very interesting um, insights in the, uh, from the legal perspective to uh, pandemic time. This was um, really, it's really important to deal with this because this, the legal, the normative um, system is, of course, part what we have to um, uh, consider in the quintuple helix as well. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to Professor Onur Pollat uh, from Ankara University, um, uh, Hosh Geldinis. Um, before uh, we start, I would like to introduce him um, shortly. Uh, Professor Dr. Onur Pollat from Ankara University School of uh, is from Ankara University School of Medicine. He's graded, graduated from Hajjatepe University Medical School, and he has his PhD on um, orthopedy in Ankara University between. 96 and 2001. He has been working as a professor of the Department of Emergency Medicine in uh, Ankara University and he will talk about emergency healthcare management in the COVID-19 pandemic. The floor Thank is you yours. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you, with this collaboration. We, I saw a great, excellent work here. I'm glad to be here as a part of, a little part of this project while in my speech. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank to Mr. Lutz Peschke for being a part of this project, also being a part of this work. And Selda Peshke, of course, I want to uh, thank for her for being a pr part of this project. I'm a medical doctor, as mentioned before. So I'm now presenting the hospital part of the COVID-19 process. Uh, I'm an orthopedic and traumatology surgeon working in emergency department, so I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 hospital process. What were the challenges during pandemic? Challenges in the triage process. Triage means, I'm really interested in triage. Uh, triage means giving the priority uh, of the emergent cases in the emergency medicine. And the second one changes in the non-COVID patients management algorithms, updates in the COVID patients management algorithms. In COVID-19 pandemic, the ED management has several structure adjustments in the emergency departments, changes in patient management algorithms. Here is our ED visits. You can see ED visits, emergency department visits. So, uh, in 19, it's growing up and up here. It's growing up and up here. It's that we used to get the emergency cases. And in 2020, the first case that we saw in Turkey, uh, it's growing down. The application of the emergency department is growing down in 2020. That's why, because people uh, were afraid to apply the emergency department because of the COVID-19. Only the ill, the, the only the patients 
came to the emergency department. That's why the applications is getting lower at that time. And it's going upper and upper as we used to it. And these ED visits, we can see here, we can see here, the COVID-19 patients fluctuation, the application of the COVID-19 patients fluctuation, and here it's still going on. Of course, we know that it's still going on. And here, the non-COVID patients applica applications, you can see here. During COVID-19 period, the emergency, uninterrupted emergency healthcare, we have COVID-19 patients, patients with other medical emergencies. Most of the patients in need of critical care and those requiring hospitalization first apply to the emergency departments. Uh, the emergency medicine approach to the COVID-19 pandemic focuses Identification, identification, identifying patients infected with COVID-19, treating these patients with a multidisciplinary approach, stabilizing the vital functions of critically ill patients. The emergency department config configuration, in order to minimize the risk of transmission, patients with COVID-19 related symptoms should be separated from other patients. These patients should be provided with a surgical face mask to prevent contamination. Here you can see our uh, hospital emergency department. In front of the department, we had a pre-triage area, pre-triage area here, a box of pre-triage area. Pre-triage should be performed in a department outside the emergency department before entering the emergency department for all patients who apply to the emergency department. This is the flow chart of the emergency department, of our emergency department. This is the, the patients applied to the first pre-triage area, and then symptoms are questions. Which symptoms are there questions? Are questioned or were questioned? Fever, hysteria of fever, cough, difficulty of breathing, sore throat, muscle pain, headache, test, odor loss, and diarrhea. The symptoms are questioned. <coughs> if there is a yes question, the patient sent to the COVID-19 area, and this 19 area is some uh, subclasses, medium risk area units, and contaminated area, which has, which contains isolated rooms. If the symptoms are questions are or were no, the, we have the secondary tri triage unit, level one to five. One means the most important one. Five means the least important uh, emergent cases. And then we have areas uh, under this session, low risk area unit, trauma unit, and resuscitation unit. The secondary triage, if the patient can go to the secondary triage, had no COVID-19 symptoms, it's a low risk area where patients at low risk for COVID-19 are re-triaged. Relatives of the patients are not admitted to the enter emergency department due to the risk of contamination. Arrangements have been made for patients to wait in accordance with social distance. The low risk area, clean area, uh, contains restrooms, healthcare personnel, secretaries, data processing rooms, and etc. Treatment and follow up patients who have no signs of symptoms of COVID 19 patients. This is the low risk area. Waiting areas only patients should be taken to the waiting areas to prevent cross infections that may develop due to the overcrowding. Trauma and resuscitation area during the pandemic, the use of personal uh, protective equipment should be given importance when caring for the trauma patients. If uh, the patient go to the medium risk area, its entrance is in a separate place from the emergency room entrance. Personal wor working in this field work with full personal protective equipment. You can see here the personal with that area. 
vital uh, patients with suspected COVID-19 or known to have COVID-19, vital signs are within normal limits with a good general condition. High contaminated area, patients with suspected COVID-19 or known to have COVID-19, need of critical care, transmissions in area is a quite high and you can see the personnel working there with protective equipment. And you can see here the isolated rooms uh, and also an, a, an isolated separate elevator. In hospital transfer of COVID-19 patients, we should uh, provide a separate elevator for the hospital pass. Emergency uh, st department staff Minimum staff, in order to reduce the viral load, the minimum number of personnel who can assure the functioning of the emergency service should work at each shift. Training of staff. All staff should be given training on new regulations, use of personal protective equipment, things to consider before shift, things to consider during shift, things to consider after shift. And also we had guidelines from World Health Organization, CDC, and of course, Ministry of Health in Turkey, Turkey. And at last, uh, healthcare professionals, I want to say something. Many studies in the literature have revealed that although healthcare professionals are aware of the occupational risks they may encounter during pandemics and considered concerned about the safety of themselves and their families. They work with a sense of duty and self-sacrifice. I want to thank you for listening to me. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pollard, for this um, uh, important um, the contribution. I must say I bow my head on all healthcare professionals, especially in the emergency sector, because it was really a very um, hard time, I can imagine, especially to decide to, to make the triage um, management and especially to, yeah, in fact, decide who should survive and whom let we die in these situations, unfortunately, we had. Thank you very much for your These presentation. Are all my colleagues, all my assistants working in emergency departments in Turkey, in Ankara University. Thank you for all your support. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, Loya Saide Begum uh, Feziolu. And she was graduated from Koch University Faculty of Law and she completed her master's degrees in the field of sustainable development and strategic leadership at the Belinge um, Institute of Technologies uh, with a scholarship from the Swedish Institute. Uh, between uh, 2018 and 2021, she worked as a legal consultant in pri private hospitals and health information companies. Since uh, 2021, um, uh, Begum Feziolo um, worked as health um, informatics law consultant at the Ministry of Health of Turkey. Um, healthcare law, IT law, personal data protection law, European Union grant agreements and sports law are her fields of expertise. She speaks, she, she speaks fluently English and inter intermediate Swedish, I hope, uh, uh, Black King Institute was <laughs> uh, translate, um, um, pronounced in the right way. And <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and uh, she is talking now about the protection of health data during the pandemic time. Begum. Oh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Honorable uh, professors and guests, thank you for inviting me to this distinguished conference, along with such valuable experts in the field. Uh, my name is Begin Feizoğlu. Uh, I am an attorney at law, working as a consultant on healthcare informatics law. Uh, at the Ministry of Health of Turkey. Uh, this is not uh, so usual for a public institution or a ministry to employ uh, several legal experts in data protection and privacy 
but needless to say, needless to say that healthcare data is so special compared to other types of data. So Ministry of Health employs several legal and technical experts on, uh, on data protection and privacy, and I am one of them. So the pandemic proposed uh, several challenges on how to balance between protecting health data or other types of personal data and protecting public and individual health and fight the pandemic. We have all been through this, not only Turkey, but the whole world. So needless to say, processing personal health data uh, was quite important in our fight with the pandemic. Therefore, uh, as the experts uh, working in this field, we had to find a balance between protecting the personal data uh, of individuals and still being able to keep fighting with the pandemic with accurate data. Uh, not only us, but also data protection authorities in Turkey and all across the globe all underwent the same challenges, we can say. They had to balance between personal data protection and privacy measures and measures to be taken in order to fight the pandemic. So today I would like to talk about why protect, protecting personal health data is crucial and what are the legal frameworks uh, which govern the protection of healthcare data. Then I would like to explain why we need to collect and process personal data in order to fight the pandemic. Uh, then I would like to give some examples regarding data protection authorities' perspective on this issue. Uh, then I will keep on talking on unique challenges protecting health data, personal health data during the pandemic. And I will explain how Ministry of Health of Turkey tackled these challenges. So protecting personal health data is crucial for several reasons. Uh, personal health data contains sensitive information about an individual's medical conditions, treatments and healthcare uh, history. <coughs> Unauthorized access to this data can lead to potential discrimination, stigma stigmatization, or harm to an individual's reputation, or harm to an individual's self. Uh, imagine a woman, <coughs> an unmarried woman, going through an abortion, or imagine a person with HIV positive diagnosis. Needless to explain more. So trust also trust between patients and healthcare providers relies on the assurance that personal health data will be kept confidential. This is this goes back to Hippocrates. Uh, this is not a new uh, concept. Uh, and failure to protect this data erodes trust and can hinder individuals from seeking necessary medical care. They can they can just say that I'm not uh, convinced that my healthcare data will be protected in a in necessary manner, so I am refraining from going to a healthcare healthcare uh, facility, and I'm I'm not going to receive treatment. <coughs> so this would be a basic violation of uh, right to health and right to access to quality medical uh, service. And lastly, safeguarding personal health data is a legal and ethical responsibility. That being said, during the pandemic, all across the globe, it was necessary to process health data more intensively than ever to protect public health and individual health. We have all been through this, not only Turkey, but the whole world. And among several functions of data processing during this time, uh, public health surveillance, we had to do it. We had to process health data, allow, and this allowed us to monitor the spread of the disease. We identified hotspots and made 
informed decisions about implementing control and measures. We all use Hayatebe SWAR applications, application. Uh, we in the ministry analyze such data as case numbers, hospitalizations, and mortality rates. Uh, public health officials could assess the severity of the pandemic, and we knew that which hospitals needed which equipments before these uh, statistics were being gathered in the center, Ministry of Health, and we were able to manage this uh, crisis with accurate information and data. So processing health data played a vital role in, in contact tracing efforts, and we identified and tracked individuals who have come into contact with an infected pers person, and this helped us to break the chain of transmission and prevent further, further spread of the virus. Hayat or, or Life Fits into Home application is not the only uh, example. There are or several examples across the world. And yet, it was still very important that processing health data during the pandemic was done in compliance with data protection laws. We, we couldn't say that data protection laws don't work during these extreme uh, situations because I explained how crucial healthcare data is. And uh, we had to find still, we, in these extreme situations, we had to find ways to safeguard individuals' privacy and ensure data security. And balancing the need for data processing to fight with pandemic and uh, still take into consideration these privacy concerns was our challenge. Not as uh, legal practitioners, not uh, only as the Ministry of Health of Turkey, but also data protection authorities also had the same challenge. And Turkish Data Protection Authority made a written public announcement on March 2020, and they had to because they knew that going so strict and refraining from uh, processing any type of healthcare data uh, wouldn't help us to fight the pandemic. So they said as long as the data processing is carried in accordance with law and data processors and controllers take necessary technical and administrative measures for data security and privacy, this is in accordance with the provisions of tur Turkish data protection law. So they opened the road for us, for the Turkish Ministry of Health. And they said that decisions taken on this subject should be within the framework of the guidance or instructions of the Ministry of Health of Turk Turkey uh, or other relevant institutions. And European Data Protection Board also followed the same approach. Uh, they made a similar statement on March to 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 2020. Uh, 2020. And they said that data protection rules such, a, such as the GDPR don't hinder measures taken in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic uh, and the fight against communica communicable diseases such as COVID is a valuable goal shared by all nations and therefore should be supported in the best possible way and still similar to KVKK, our National Data Protection Authority, they said that even so in, the, in these exceptional times we have to take necessary legal measures. So they just relaxed a little bit and opened the road, but said that we still need to follow certain uh, guidelines and regulations. So it was a challenge for all, for practitioners like me, organizations, ministries, data protection authorities, we try to find a balance between data protection and privacy measures and actions need to be taken in the fight for pandemic. And no matter how detailed the regulations were during the pandemic, the world encountered unique challenges in protecting personal data. Now I want to talk about some key challenges that emerged. For example, during the pandemic, data collection electronic data co collection increased drastically. The pandemic led to a surge in data collection efforts, including contact 
tracing, testing results, vaccination records, this sheer vo volume and a variety of health data being controlled pose challenges in ensuring proper storage, management, and protection of sensitive information. Uh, and also, we have all witnessed rapid implementation of digital health solutions because people couldn't go to the hospitals and we uh, healthcare facilities offered some alternative uh, service methods. They, they made available to patients telehealth or remote health uh, options. And while these technologies offered convenience and access to healthcare services, this also introduced new vulnerabilities and potential security risks uh, if not implemented and secured because let's say that you are communicating with your doctor with a not secure uh, medium, uh, not secure medium, then you are uh, pr making your healthcare data being processed in an unsecure uh, medium, technological medium. Also, we have witnessed that uh, cyber security threats inc in increased because people were not physically available, they were in lockdown. So the best way for uh, criminals to uh, commit uh, cyber crimes and the pandemic witnessed a surge in cyber attacks targeting healthcare organizations and critical infra infra infrastructure and cyber criminals exploited the fear in individuals and they gained unauthorized access to health data, dis disrupted healthcare services and demanded ransom payments. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't witnessed this in Turkey, but um, in, in other parts of the world, we have several examples. So now I would like to talk about how we tackle challenges these challenges as the Ministry of Health of Turkey. Uh, we quickly developed Hayat Evesar application, Life Fits into Home app. It's a contact tracing application among with other uh, properties. Uh, and some of its key features were, were COVID-19 case tracking. Uh, it provided real-time data on COVID-19 cases, including the number of active cases, recoveries, and so on. We did quarantine monitoring. Uh, we featured, we, we listed individuals who are required to undergo quarantine, and we, followed, fo we made follow-ups. Follow and we also used this application uh, for people who want to travel by bus or by plane. Uh, so this application stored all data encrypted and we didn't use any uh, Turkish identification number, TC kimlik numarası. There was no TC kimlik numarası or per personal identification number in this application. Uh, HES code we used and they were self-generated by individuals. They couldn't be followed uh, to Turkish identification numbers, and people were able to generate as many as codes as possible and delete codes anytime. So it was not possible to trace the identity of a person or access Turkish identifi identification number through his code. We also gave many options to our citizens to get HES code. We didn't uh, say that you have to download this app. You can also use e-government applications or s send SMS services. We also, we also had public health management platform and uh, public health management platform fetched its data from HES uh, SASA and complex health informatics system integrated with more than 30 systems and institutions. It was, you can see here, that we managed the pandemic with this integrated healthcare informatics solutions. And all healthcare data stored in the pandemic required two-factor authentication to access. Access rights were given based on need-to-know principle and tailored according to the user's role in the system. And administrators working in the center uh, and working in the regions had different access rights. 
And we also did something very important uh, that I uh, personally participated in the preparation process. We uh, enacted regulation on the delivery of remote healthcare services, telehealth services. And as I said, the pandemic accelerated the adoption of digital solutions. So there were many te uh, telemedicine platforms and remote monitoring systems. Uh, but we weren't sure if these softwares were secure enough. Uh, so regulation on the delivery of remote healthcare services published in official gazettes uh, came into force in February 2022, and we determined the rules of providing, providing remote healthcare services. So this is very important, I believe. Now in Turkey, if any public ins uh, healthcare institution wants to provide remote healthcare services, they can't do it on WhatsApp or other types of video applications. They have to provide, uh, they have to uh, produce a software and the software should undergo several security uh, audits made by the Ministry of Health. Uh, these audits are made by software engineers, network security specialists, cyber incident response team members, and these are not easy tests to pass. And only the softwares which comply with data protection and security requirements are able to com commercialize their products. So you can trust if you are receiving a, a telehealth service in Turkey, you can, you can trust that this software is secure and passed many tests by experts and then uh, ac accredited to be commercialized. And also, I, 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 in, in another important uh, article in this, in this uh, regulation is that it is mandatory for both parties to be able to record video or voice because you are using a software and you don't know if the patient is recording or the doctor is recording and what will happen to this recording. So this is a special type of process. Uh, if both parties uh, allow this recording, uh, this, this recording will be, s uh, will be kept in the facility itself and no parties, either the doctor or the patient, will, will be able to access. So summing up, I am summing up. First time in history, we have gathered such valuable data on how to fight with the pandemic. How a pandemic starts, spreads, gets under control. We, ha we had been through more pandemics in the past, uh, Spanish flu and many other, uh, many other pandemics, but this was the first time that we had some such good quality uh, data. And this was due to the advanced health informatics techs, tech. And now the world acknowledging the value of this data and looking for ways to make use of it for scientific purposes. A significant development that I want to mention before giving end to my presentation is uh, Europe's European Health Data Space uh, Initiative. This initiative driven is driven by the European Commission to enhance uh, the secure and interoperable sharing of health data across the European borders. It aims to create a digital ecosystem that allo allows for the exchange and utilization of health data for research, healthcare delivery, and public health purposes while maintaining uh, data protection and privacy stand standards. Uh, I will pass this. So, last words. I don't think that these kind of initiatives will be possible without a pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. Balancing between making use of the big data in healthcare and protecting personal health data have never been more important. And I believe that more institutions, just like the Ministry of Health of Turkey, should employ legal and technical experts on data protection and privacy. Uh, I hope I didn't 
uh, talk too much. Uh, I would like to thank you, and that's it. Yeah, thank you very much, Big and Faze for your um, very interesting um, insights, especially from the top uh, perspective of the Ministry of Health in uh, Turkey. This is very important. We learned yesterday from our project partner, um, Franz Volkwort, that um, in fact the the public gives very much important on data protection over all other um, um, criteria for the choice to use um, um, apps and therefore it is very important for us to understand your perspective if there is. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now I would last but definitely not least I would like to give the floor to my beloved wife and project partner, Professor Selda Günesh Peschke. She was um, graduated from Ankara University Faculty of Law and she finis finished her master and PhD in Ankara University Institute of Social Science. Between 95 and 97, she worked in the privatization administration as a lawyer and 1997, uh, uh, she had started her academic career in Gazi University Faculty of Law as research assistant. <coughs> By the scholarship of um, Italian government between 2000 and 2001, she attended graduate program Corso di Perfezionamento and um, did her research for PhD in Roma La Sapienza University. She got her scholarship from um, the German Academic Exchange Service and um, uh, Max Planck Institute between 2006 and 2012. Since 2015, she is professor um, of private law at Ankara Yildin Behazit University. And she talks now about digitalization of legal practices during the pandemic. After several technical preparations, we will <laughs> do it, maybe with, with yeah. the floor is yours. <laughs> Dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, I start first here, maybe it's better. Uh, Dear uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all in the second day and the last panel of our conference and the last speaker. Uh, so I don't have the option to speak very long, I, I guess because of the time management. Uh, but I would like to sum up. Uh, the topic which I will talk uh, today uh, with you is the digit uh, digitalization of legal practice during the pandemic. And uh, we have prepared this with my uh, assistant, also a master student, Dr. Uh, Yasin Aydoğdu, doctor, because the second master with me, uh, she, he is doing right now. So, when the COVID-19 virus had spread all around the world, uh, legal professionals wondered how the crisis would affect their work. As it is known, uh, the legal profession is done mostly in crowded places, uh, such as law offices, as you see, notaries, courthouses, uh, arbitration or mediation uh, centers, where the citizens and the practitioners of law work uh, together. The pandemic period uh, brought pressure and stress over the lawyers, uh, judges, uh, and also uh, other legal professionals. As a result, the pandemic has brought a period in which digitalization is necessary and mandatory in terms of law. When the pandemic period uh, uh, came, the new practices in civil and penal procedure came into force. Legal process started using online tools uh, for the first time, or more than ever, uh, such as e-hearings were done, e-signature uh, was used very uh, often, witnesses attended to the hearings online, teleconferences uh, continued uh, with this process. 
uh, and e-notice entered into practice as well and many more we can count. And uh, when we see uh, the developments about the AI and law, when we uh, see it, AI started to be, uh, artificial intelligence uh, started to be used uh, in the legal uh, practice before the pandemic impact, uh, in fact. But within the pandemic period, there was an increase in the developments of digitalization in legal practice. Big data and AI are permitted in our social lives, but also they are increasing in legal practice and processes. Now, when we see, uh, I would like to now take the microphone if it's possible, but. <laughs> so. Uh, it is coming, okay, thank you. So uh, when we see uh, the AI and the law, as you know, artificial intelligence is uh, usually uh, coming from uh, all uh, as an international process in every country we can see this, but uh, also there's a terminology of law as well. So when we are doing the artificial intelligence, the institutions, the terminology, uh, and uh, in this uh, matter, we have to think also the terminations are the same in each country, how is the termination of law? Because when we want to translate, for example, from Turkish to English or from English to Turkish, sometimes we cannot find the exact words. For that reason, there should be a common terminology, especially for the legal institutions, according to me. I don't want to talk about the terminology uh, that much, but the AI started to be used in the uh, legal uh, process uh, before the pandemic, as I told you, and it came from machine learning, as you know, to now machine lowing. So in uh, some of the countries like China, we have seen that there's a regular use of the softwares uh, and uh, in, the, in the courts, the judges are using these softwares. Uh, but in some of the countries, uh, we don't see uh, that much. So this is very important, just uh, ju uh, judge discretion as a human being and the uh, Principles of equity are very important. So for that reason, as a robot, can the robot decide? We have to ethically also think about these as well. I would like to come now the uh, pandemic period. How was the digitalization of law during the pandemic period? I, would I want to give some examples from Turkey, what uh, has been done. Uh, the things uh, which we have engaged at that period were the e-hearings we have seen, teleconference process in mediation and arbitration processes, e-signatures used very often, uh, and we have a, a special software called UYAP, the uh, judges uh, or the lawyers are using, and e-notice is used as well. So how was the process? I would like to, I'm jumping uh, because of the time management a little bit, but in the mediation process between four to eight weeks, as you know, and uh, this mediation process, mostly we engage with the teleconferences. We sometimes did Zoom meetings, sometimes with the telephone, uh, WhatsApp uh, conversations with the parties, but the uh, most important thing was uh, that the signatures uh, of the uh, parties, this we did with the e-signatures, but if they didn't have the parties, they don't have e-signatures, at that time we had to uh, post these uh, notices, the uh, last uh, results, and we needed their physical signatures as well. In the uh, arbitration process, we did the same, but the uh, uh, difference was we had to give uh, really physical signatures. For that reason, we did uh, most of the Zoom meetings via uh, uh, online uh, tools, but also we had the uh, physical uh, signatures as well. What else I would like to come, as, uh, you, uh, as I told you, we have UAP system, lawyers, judges, uh, mediators, prosecutors are using this system. This is a central system. Uh, 
and uh, all the process, legal process, you can follow as a, a legal profession. And the Ministry of Justice is uh, the uh, is uh, developed this uh, technology with their methodologies. I can say, uh, and um, right now there are also e-hearings going on. I can say you have to apply uh, via UYAP uh, as a lawyer, uh, and then the uh, judge should accept it at that time. E-hearing is done uh, under these uh, circumstances. You can see it easily. Uh, thank you for your attention. A brief overview about uh, that and I apologize that we have a little bit to run up because we have another reception uh, with the Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs. I would like um, to thank you and to, um, uh, uh, to uh, ask every uh, panelist here to the stage for fa last family photo. Why everybody is coming, I would like to thank you for your participation. First of all, all contributors to the conference, but also to the audience. I hope we could give you some as, um, interesting aspects about our work in Pandavita on the one hand side, but also about the needs of different kind of collaboration processes in pandemic times, because our aim must be that we are much better prepared when the next pandemic time will come. I, I wish you all um, um, a good journey back wherever you live and, and thank you very much again for your participation and goodbye. Yes, please. Annie and Ruben auch. Genau, David.